Anyway, though, let's go and get started. I'm going to share screen. So this morning we are look our service we focused on the uh, Torah portion of Shabbat Yitro, um, and there's some we're going to be looking at specifically a humanistic take on this text. Um, but to go ahead and get us started, we'll be getting. And by the way, a lot of our liturgy um, is done written by Martin DiMaggio, who's who he leads. He and I rotate in leading service most most of the time. So I really like his humanistic takes on this traditional liturgy, but in very different directions. So, so who would like to start us off? Would like to read the English text here? Feel free to unmute yourself and go for it if you'd like to read. I'd be happy to read. Okay. Uh, how good are the dwellings where we gather? serene and vibrant as the gardens by the river, the aloes and the pleasant cedar trees beside the water. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for people to dwell together in harmony. Ine mato humanaim, Ine mato shevaramim gam yakad, Ine mato humanaim, shevaramim gam yakad. And who would like to read the English for this one? I'll scroll that down a little bit, see better. Uh, let's see. Um, let me fix this so it'll be a little bit easier to see. Uh, there we go. Okay, so who would like to read on the left side? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and we humanity choose to keep a day of rest as an agreement for all time. For in six days we work, and on the seventh we cease from work and are refreshed. Veshomrim benehadamet hashabat. La so det hashahabad le dorotum berit o holam. Veshamrim beneadam met hashahabad. La so det hashahabad le dorotum berit o holam. Gisha shed yami masu malaka, asu malaka. Veshomrim beneadam, veshomrim beneadam, met hashabat, lasot et hashabat, le dortum burrito holam, le dortum burrito holam, burrito holam, uva yom hashvi shav tu vienafashu veshomrim beneadam et hashabat. La sort et hashabat le dortum burrito lam. And so now we have a practice for our version of our coup. I'm going to un um, unshare the screen for a moment and I'm going to invite us all to take a moment and to look on your screen at the participants. You can see. Some of the people of us have our cameras on. And so just take a moment to look at the other faces, of the people who we are here with today that crossing from literally the other side of the world today. We have folks from Australia, from North America, from Europe on today that I know of and probably other places as well. But to take a moment to wish each of these persons uh, a good Shabbat and to just recognize our common humanity. And let me go back to share screen. 
And so we take this time now to bless the community which blesses us. Blessed is the community which blesses forever and ever. Barku et hakalal amivirak baruch hakal kam kamivirak lealam va'ed. And now we come to our version of the Shema. Who would like to read the text on the left side? Listen, Israel, our people are one. Humanity is one. Let us work together to improve this world. Shema Yisrael Echad Amenu Adam Echad Ulanu Navad Letakein Et Haolam Hazeh And who would like to read the left side of this text? And let us love our fellow as ourselves, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And let the words always be always upon our hearts. And do we have any Hebrew readers today who would want to read the right side? Okay, I'll go ahead and give it a try, but uh, I'm not as comfortable on this one, so we'll, I'll give it a try. They have ta aka kamoka beko lavka uvko nafshka uvko me odeka. Vihiyu hadvarim halel al lavaka tamid. And who would like to read the text on the left side here? Impressing them upon our children, reciting them when we stay at home and when we go out. When we lie down and we when we get up, binding them as signs in her hand, serving as a symbol on our forehead, inscribing them on the doorpost of our homes and on our gates. This we believe to be true. Humankind is capable of redeeming itself from its troubles. Through our efforts, we heal disease, feed the hungry, lift up and free the downtrodden. We can achieve liberation through reason, compassion, and working together with trust in one another, with faith of a better future for all. Blessed is the light in humanity with which we redeem the world. And we now come to our version, uh, one of our versions of the Amidah. This is traditionally the standing prayer, but it's also a time in many services where that there's space for silent or contemplative prayer. And so kind of riffing on that idea, this is a silent meditation. And so I invite you for this to take a moment and you know feel free to turn off your camera if you'd like, close your eyes, whatever's comfortable for you for this meditative time. Also, this is what's called a breath meditation, which is where we focus on our breathing. But everyone breathes at a different pace. And so feel free to breathe at your pace. I'll be giving instructions if you wanna follow a rhythm, but again, feel free to do your own thing too, that's fine. We'll take a moment to get grounded. Breathing in, I take breath into myself. Breathing out, I join the web of being. Breathing in, I rest in the present. Breathing out, I'm part of past and future. Breathing in, I honor the shrine of my body. Breathing out, I honor the shrine of the cosmos. Breathing in, presence fills me. Breathing out, presence enfolds me. Breathing in, I witness what is broken. Breathing out, I bow to what is perfect. Breathing in, I offer gratitude for what is. Breathing out, I accept all that changes. 
Breathing in, I pray for peace for myself. Breathing out, I pray for peace for all beings. Now we'll stop here for a moment for some silent meditation. So for the mor this morning for the Devar Torah time, um, I'm going to be reading. We're first going to read through uh, a text from the from the Torah passage for this week, Yitro. And Yitro is an interesting text, and it's one that it seems like people that do Devar Torah go a couple of different directions most commonly. One is they talk about the beginning of the text, where Yitro, Moses's father-in-law, tells Moses like. Your organization, your, your leadership program is not working. You're trying to do everything. You have to learn to delegate. You have to learn to share responsibility. And so this is where we Moses develops hierarchy. He develops how do we govern this community effectively. And so that's one direction you could go with Parashat y Yitro. And it's, and it's a good one. It's a great point. Uh, but that's not the message for today. I instead decided to focus on the, the second chunk of it, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And part of the reason for this is in Oklahoma, where I live, our state legislature is yet again trying to put the Ten Commandments back at the state capitol. Even though the state Supreme Court has said you can't do this, you can't favor one religion over others, despite the fact that it violates not only the federal constitution, but the state constitution, they're going to try to do it again. And so it's, of course, causing a lot of conversation among uh, people in Oklahoma, obviously, and especially for religious folks, uh, because one of the big issues is the version of the Ten Commandments that Oklahoma, the Oklahoma legislature wants to put at the Capitol is from the King James Bible, and it's the numbering system used by evangelical Protestants. And that's a comp that's and the issue of numbering is important because no one agrees on the Ten Commandments, how they're numbered. The Jewish community largely has one way of numbering, evangelical Protestants a second way, mainline Protestants a third way, and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians a fourth way. Uh, it's not easy to break them down into the, the numbering. <laughs> but, you know, the more I thought about this, this issue of the Ten Commandments really got me thinking more about, well, what do we do with them as humanist, humanistic Jews? I mean, it's a part of our culture. Uh, it's a part of our story. And yet, there's some problems. And so I'm going to go ahead and share screen for this part so we can read this together. Uh, let me pull it up on Safari. Uh, let me unshare for a moment while I find the text. I had it right in front of me, but I don't want y'all to have to look at me one from page to page because that can be a little bit uh, nausea inducing. Okay, I'll share screen again. And by the way, the version I'll be reading, it, this is from Safari, but it's from the Contemporary Torah, which JPS put out in 2006. And I'm going to go and start the verse, verse right before that kind of starts this preface. It says, and Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. God spoke all these words, saying, I, yod heh vav -Heh, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below or on the waters under the earth. You shall bow. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, your God, yod heh vav -Heh, am an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation of those who reject me but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not swear falsely by the name, a name of your God, yod heh vav -Heh, for yod heh vav -Heh will not clear one who swears falsely by God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall, you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of your God, yod heh vav -Heh. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle, or the stranger who is who is within your settlements. For in six days, yod heh vav -Heh made heaven and earth and sea, and all that is in them. And they rested on the seventh day. Therefore, yod heh vav -Heh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
Honor your father and your mother that you may long endure on the land that your God, yod heh vav -He, is assigning to you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or ass or anything that is your neighbor's. All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the blare of the horn and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they fell back and stood at a distance. You speak to us, they said to Moses, and we will obey. But let, it, let not God speak to us, lest we die. So that's our text. Uh, a doozy of a text. You know, in getting ready for this message today, I asked on the Humanistic Judaism Facebook group for some some what, what other people were thinking about this text. And so I, I copied in some of the responses uh, folks shared. And I'm just going to read a few little excerpts of them. One person, I, I asked, what, what, what is a humanistic Jewish take on the Ten Commandments? And these are a variety of things. One person said, I see the words as a basic law for society. Even though the ideas expressed are ancient, there's still the expectation that the societies we live in has for conduct. I'm not a believer in God. However, conceptually, it's good to somewhat respect people's right to such a belief. I find that freedom from religion comes from a similar old place as the dogmatic adherence to a religion. And that's how I see the commandment of respect for God. Another person said, are the 10 ethical guidelines a community can agree to for some limited period of time? They don't have to be perfect, but for the sake of conversation, at least a place to start the dialogue. I prefer vows or guidelines to commandments personally. Another person said, humans have evolved over time that I believe the traits of a good human being is epigenetic at this point. The same could be said for the mental illnesses that cause mental condition, medical conditions like so sociopathy and psychopathy. Another person said, I really like the Unitarian Universalist humanistic Ten Commandments, if that's not too far off track. Another person said, the commandments can be seen as moral statements as well as commands of a God, just as the Torah Bible can be seen as literature. Also, the study of lawgivers across history and cultures can give perspectives on people's efforts to create ordered societies. Of course, lawgivers are not democratic figures. Another person said, I see them as one attempt to make sense in order of the, an, an order of the world and society. Some good stuff and not so good stuff. A snapshot of the way of a way of life gone by, fitting the needs of the times, some of which remains relevant to our modern world. And finally, one person in a more comedic direction said, the Ten Commandments bring more than a wish for entertainment to get the full effect, wrote New York Times critic Bosley Crowther in 1956. A sexy take on the Bible of Anne Baxter batting her eyes at a chiseled Charlton Heston. John Derrick and Joel Brenner also steam it up. Restored in VistaVision and surround sound on DVD. <laughs> so anyway, you see though in these in these uh, off-the-cuff responses, people shared a wide variety of ways people have engaged with the text. And so the challenge for today is we're going to go into breakout rooms in a moment, and I'm going to encourage you to... Uh, consider what is for you. How do you want to take the Ten Commandments today? What is the relevance for you, but particularly, again, seen in this humanistic lens? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the chat a link to the Safaria. So if you want to pull up the text again while you're talking about it, you can. But I think we'll go into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. And I think, let's see, how many people do we have today? It looks like one, two, three. Okay, so I think we're going to break, I'll break us up into three groups, if I can, yeah, we'll do it into three groups, and, yeah, so we'll, we'll and we'll be for there for about 10 minutes, and I may uh, jump in and out of groups a little bit, but uh, otherwise, uh, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Are you, are you doing this, James? You're creating this? I am. Okay, great. Well, I can always tell when there's lively conversation because everyone's slow to come back from the breakout rooms, which is pretty awesome. So so for now, for this next bit of time, we'll now have some space to, to unpack a little bit of what we were talking about in the breakout rooms. So if anyone would like to share 
ideally at least one or two people from each group to share some of what y'all talked about and we can bring it all together it would be really awesome I guess I'll start. We we all agreed that none of us felt very related to the Ten Commandments. We never thought about it. <laughs> but then we went on to talk about some very important interpretations or comments on them from Eric Fromm, from Alan Dershowitz, and uh, briefly Hannah Arendt was mentioned. And, um, and then we talked about how some people claim just having, believing in God makes you moral somehow because they have the Ten Commandments when clearly they don't act like that necessarily. And uh, oh, I forget what else we were talking about. Um, anyone else have anything else to add on that? Well, I don't know. Oh, and we thought that we, kindness would be- Yeah, I say we agreed that <laughs> kindness should be in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> really be number yeah. one. Should be number yeah. one, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But what other groups have thought have thoughts? I like the idea that the kindness has being a, an overarching commandment. Um, some of the things that we talked about is um, a lack of like not feeling like it would be okay to place something like the Ten Commandments um, in a public place like that because um, you know as mentioned like this version of the Ten Commandments is only one version um, and it doesn't necessarily rep represent different people and different beliefs. It feels more like an imposition and um, mm -hmm. how would you go about choosing um, whichever translation or version um, of the 10 commandments. Um, and like this idea of being okay with other people um, who have different beliefs, but there's a difference with being okay and then imposing and kind of navigating that like we can feel comfortable um and even fellowship with people who have very different beliefs from us but it's not okay to impose um those beliefs um mm -hmm. on our beliefs on other people or for them to it doesn't none of us want that for ourselves either mm -hmm. um were there other things that i'm missing you got it oh i summed it up beautifully <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting to talk about how the Ten Commandments, um, somebody uh, had pointed out, David had pointed out like that um, to the Ten Commandments, the first version was destroyed. Um, and so there are these different versions even in the Bible. And maybe we don't even know what those the first ones were. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about how uh, they've also changed and they were as they were translated, they were changed. So you know, it's just, it's, it's a kind of a fascinating like window into like where humans were at that time, but it's, it's doesn't mean it's applicable, uh, completely applicable to now. Yeah. Well, one thing that got mentioned in the group I was in was, um, the thing about uh, worshiping no gods besides Yahweh and how um, not everyone has much use for that commandment. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there, there are people who don't worship any other gods but don't worship that god either. And... Um, it got mentioned that he says in somewhere in that passage something about being the God who led us out of Egypt. And um, the person who mentioned that uh, started talking about Egypt as more of a concept than a nation. Well, like, uh, we're all. Like, we're always in some form of Egypt within ourselves. It was really interesting what she said. I think part of that goes back to the name Egypt in Hebrew is Misraim, I believe. And it means literally a narrow place. And so it's this, it does have this poetic ring of, you know, could be applied to other contexts. 
Another thing that came up, I was in your group for part of the time, was the idea that the the commandment of do not commit adultery in one sense seems like a universal theme of we should honor the commitments of our relationships. At the same time, there's problems with that. One is that that's privileging one way human relationships are organized. Not everyone marriage works for that. Um, and that might have been the norm that that, uh, you know, heterosexual marriage is once the norm. It's not the norm for us today that we organize ourselves. And that's just one way. Um, you know, to me, I think it could be universalized a little bit to say that in whatever relationships you're in, be kind and fair to everyone involved, uh, follow the, the, you know, follow the thing, the, the rules that you and your, your relationship you've re ne mutually negotiated. I'd be in favor of that, but of saying that this is the only way relationships should be done. And therefore this being privileged above all else, I, I don't think I'm in favor of that. Right. Um, yeah, relationships and families can be anything you make them. Mm -hmm. I do feel, at least in like the real conservative, like Christian household that I grew up in, that was never the case, though. There is this fear around anything that people would consider different or other. Oh, and yeah. so you stay away from it. That's not allowed. That's rejected. Um, and that was something that I was in when you were reading the text before we did the breakout groups. It's like there's a pettiness to this God that's like, you can't worship anyway. Else, otherwise, I'm going to punish you. It's like, that's not love. That's not a relation. That's not genuine. And it strikes me that it feels so human to me, this document. It's like, right, this is like some of our worst instincts as humans is to be petty, is to be cruel, is to like shut other people's ideas down and to not accept that there are actually so many ways to go about life and there's nothing wrong with them. Like we shouldn't, I think Phyllis was saying this, like, right, you don't want to hurt people. That belief is not okay. But as long as you're not hurting people, probably your way about going about life is just fine. Mm -hmm. It's not right. It's not wrong. It just, but it's okay. And you don't, yeah. that doesn't come through in the text, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like the worst of human impulses is what, is often shared, I think, in some of these biblical stories. And yet I've come full circle on some of that stuff because um, my mother was horribly neglected and abused as a child. Um, she grew up as the child of um, sharecroppers and her mom abandoned her and left her with her father. And her father raised her, but he did a terrible job. I mean, he did what he knew to do, but it was terrible. Um, and so she converted, she, he, he was a Southern Baptist minister deep in the South in the, you know, 19, early 1900s. And, um, you know, if you know anything about Southern Baptists is very fundamental. Um, <clears throat> and so when she grew up and had all of us, she converted to another fundamental Christian faith, which was very, very strict. And we were raised in that faith. But to her, it was more liberating than what she grew up with. And so she grew up with this vision of God as this strict punishing, you know, thing who would get her dad, basically, you know, because <laughs> that's what she needed to believe to be one step further. But she encouraged all of us to find the path that would free us. She didn't raise us telling us that we had to stay in that religion that she chose for herself. That was liberating for her. But she encouraged all of us, and she had 18 children, and she encouraged all of us to find the path that would liberate us. And so in our household, even though we were raised in a very fundamental Christian faith, at 12, we were allowed to declare what faith we wanted to be. And so I have a brother who's a Muslim. I'm, you know, Jewish. I have a sister who's Buddhist. You know, I mean, we just all went off and did what we wanted to do. And mm -hmm. she encouraged that, even mm -hmm. though we were raised in the Kojic church. And if you know anything about the Kojic church, they don't do that. They are very, very fundamental and very, very Ten Commandments. And God won't punish you if you even wear lipstick or long pants or, you know, girls couldn't wear pants. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have to be aware that while some people may be 
very stuck on those what we think are fundamental backward religions because i thought it was real backwards um <laughs> to some people that may be a step forward from where they were raised oh yeah and for my mom it was liberating to have that structure and those rules and guidelines that would get her to heaven from the hell she was raised in. Mm. Well, that really gets into the whole issue of how religion functions for people. And I, I've seen people that who came from really challenging circumstances and very a lot of uncertainty. And so they really latch on to the certainty that a religion can provide. And it, it can be a liberating thing. And mm -hmm. It also sometimes comes with a new set of shackles. Uh, you know, that's where, to me, it gets kind of messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some people, like the slightly less organized religions, the uncertainty of it. And also, um, well, one thing I didn't mention before, uh, a problem with you'll worship no other gods besides me, some people are still worshiping other gods in this day and age, and many of them are good people. And mm -hmm. to punish good people just for not worshiping this one god seems unjust to me. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and that goes back to the idea of using the Ten Commandments in a civic context. Um, to me, it's just so troubling because it's it's privileging one system over all others. Um, and at the same time, you know, I know, for instance, there's many other countries that in many have a lot of similarities to the U.S. in many ways, but have set the balance differently on church state relations. I know the U.K., for instance, has a state church, but also does comprehensive religious education so that if you're in a public school in the U.K., you have classes on all the different religions of learning about what Islam teaches, learning what Judaism teaches. Um, that to me is a very pluralistic kind of approach. And yet they also do culturally affirm the Church of England. Um, for us in the U.S., that seems um, is favoring one. And yet at the same time, they also do the practice of educating about all of them. Um, the U.S., we say on paper that we don't privilege any of them, but yet we don't provide education. So folks, like where I'm at, in my context, for many people, uh, particularly more rural areas, they may only be familiar with one or two religious traditions to speak of at all, uh, which is usually some multiple versions of Protestant Christianity and maybe Catholicism, but very little exposure to anything else. Um and then the but at the same time, if you look at the demographics of where people are at, like in my neighborhood here in Oklahoma City, I have neighbors that are Buddhist, neighbors who are Muslim, Hindu, um, many different kinds of Christian. Um, and so that's within a few miles, five, ten miles from here, there are people that that believe that they don't know anyone but Christians. And yet here, you know, it's very diverse. And so I think I think that's a, a changing dynamic, but it just still troubles me putting the Ten Commandments up in this way. Just really seems like a mm -hmm. wrong-headed move. Okay. Another approach that can, that you know, several people you know, when asked on Facebook about this mentioned the idea of of reconceiving the Ten Commandments, and they pointed out like the Unitarians, they are a humanistic uh, fellowship within the Unitarians, have made their own Ten Commandments, and I've seen variations on that. Um. And that's a, that's a whole other interesting concept of, of, of whether it's useful to say we, we need our own tent list of 10 or is that just a human impulse to say, oh, we like neat, neat and orderly list. But is that really necessary? I don't know. But it's an interesting question, too. I was just thinking what Tally was saying, that um, you look at the Ten Commandments and they're very basic, you know, don't covet, don't murder, don't steal, you know. And so people feel that um, if they're good on that, they're good. And we're thinking, but you're not kind and you're not accepting and you're not a lot of other good things. So it's, it is very old school. <laughs> you know, it's very way back when, when mm -hmm. just these basic things and, and nothing else got in there. 
Um, that's sort of interesting. Well, and like to me, like the commandment to not covet, in one sense, and you can read it as being about community norms of trying to encourage a community to not be fractious. On the other hand, if the person who you're coveting has gotten their wealth through ill-gotten, through bad ways, if they've cheated and stolen and exploited others, I do think there's a place sometimes of saying that's not fair. And we as a society need to do something about that. Or we as a community need to organize and do something about that. I'm, I don't know. That one in particular doesn't speak to me. I think, I think there's a difference between coveting just because you want more versus coveting because you don't have enough and other people have more than they have, should have. Um, I, to me, that's a whole different kind of dynamic than coveting, but you can read it that way. That's such a nuanced approach, right? A really nuanced, thoughtful way to think about it. And I think that is where like rules, commandments, in some ways for them to be effective, right? For us to remember them or for us to put them on a, a sign or whatever, they can't have nuance like that. Or it's, I think it's hard to have that, right? Because once you start kind of spelling those things out, it's like, well, then it's too long to be simple and simple is kind of what we're going for. So how do you have something that can be like, like guidelines or however you want to think about it, but that takes into the account that there's so much more nuance. Like we aren't just one way and that's always right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like what you, what you said, Tali. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, 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 which I find interesting. That, I mean, they did studies, and there's some debate about it if it's uh, really, really, really universal. But they, they they're, they're called hyper norms, yeah. And they're norms which they found that pretty much in all societies and all tribes and all environments that people resonate with. So there's even in small infants, you know, they have a sense of fairness, right? You give, you give two cookies to the one and one to the other, right? Uh, compassion, you know, uh, there, there, there's a basic instinct around that, that compassion is something that tends to be, you know, promoted in societies. Again, you know, you can debate about a lot of that, but there are some some some, uh, some uh, scientists who tried to break that down and try to, you know, bring all those together. And that's what they found. I mean, they found that there's certain norms, such as, uh, you know, fairness or, or compassion or whatever, which resonate. And I think it is it is important that, I mean, especially in this globalized society, I think that we do put some effort in, you know, to, to look, look, what are the basic norms that we can agree on, you know, because I think if we don't, with all the nuance, we need to understand that what you said, Tali, I mean, I think it's so, they're, they're, it's very complex once you get into the details, but to have, to be able to, to fall back on something to say, look, we all agree on basic fairness and just have that as an entry into a negotiation or have that as an entry point of, you know, a values conflict, maybe whatever, where people, everybody has a certain, you know, maybe some psychopaths not, but I think that's, that's something important. And I think maybe, uh, you know, we, there's also from a humanistic standpoint, something, you know, to just kind of, kind of have that. In, I, I keep that just in the back of my mind, you know, that you, if there are values, conflicts that I engage with, I always try to break it down and say, look, what, what are the common denominators that 99% of the time that the other person will also resonate with. You know? But the, the laws, you know, like, like, you know, the commandments and it's so rigid, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. Well, really appreciate everyone's thoughts this morning. I think we had some really good uh, things bubble up. We'll have some more time at the end. Um, we'll have leave the Zoom open for a little bit longer and continue the conversation. But we'll, let's go ahead and move back into the rest of our service. So I'm going to share screen again. Who would like to say the English on the left side? I can. Let us make peace in the world. Let us make peace for us, for all Israel, and for all humanity. And we say, Amen. 
We now turn our hearts and minds towards those who need our love, who are ill, who are lonely, who suffer pain, who have been wronged. Let us pause as we call out their names. And you can either say them out loud or put them in the chat. This morning, I'm thinking about um, Moses Mast. Gabrielle posted Don and Mary. Janet posted Janet, Benjamin, and Sandy. Carly posted Nico. May all who suffer know they are not alone. May they experience refuah shalema, the renewal of body and spirit. Makom hakoak betokenu bekorot haberka meke brotenu. May the source of strength that dwells so deep within us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing. And let us say, Amen. Mm -hmm. And now we come to our version of the Kaddish. And so for this, we're remembering those in our lives who are dear to us. And so I invite you either to say their names out loud or to put their names in the chat of, 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 of those that are dear to us that we're remembering. And also, I'll mention that we very recently had a Holocaust Remembrance Day. So today, I'm also remembering all those who who may be forgotten, who were lost in, in that time. We have several names in the chat, by the way. Let me read those real quick. Um, we have Alberto, Jose, Milton, Corey, and Anita. May there be a good remembrance and compassion and kindness and love from all the for, from all the world upon the names of our honorable loved ones who have passed from the world. Let us make a place in our hearts to remember their good names, a good memory, and let us honor them with good deeds. May their memory be a blessing forever. Amen. And now we come to our version of the Elenu. Who would like to read the text on the left side? It is upon us to praise the beauty of the world, even as we fall and rise up, and to continue the work of repairing the world. For within us is the power to build and repair, and it is in our hands to bring about liberation. And one day, humanity will be united and one in purpose. Thank you. And now we come to uh, the Kiddush. Uh, this is the blessing for wine. And so if you have wine, juice, other beverages handy this morning, I am I have hot tea. Uh, but go ahead and get your, your cup ready. I'm going to pour myself a little bit of tea myself real quick. And then we'll have Kiddush. So who would like to read the English side on the left? And I'll scroll down so it's all on the screen. There we go. I'll read it. We raise our glass the sixth day, and on the seventh day, we complete the labor which we perform. And we refrain on the seventh day from all our labor. 
and we blessed the seventh day and set it aside, for we refrain from all the labor which we have to do, keeping our glass raised. Yom Hash. Oh, go go ahead if, you, if you're comfortable. No, I'm just letting you read it. Okay. Yom Hashishi Vetakal Bayom Hashvi Hamelaka Asher Neesta. Batishabot Bayom Hashvi Kol Hamelaka Asher Neesta. Neverek et Yom Hashvi Van Kadesh Oto Kivo Shavatanu Mikol Hamelaka Asher Barkanu Laasot. Savri, Tavarim, Vekarot. Attention, friends, and we raises our glasses some more. Baruch Kaor Bakayim Pore Pore Hagafen. And we all say Amen. Amen. And then this time to grab some bread, and I need to grab mine, so I will be right back. So if you want to take a moment to grab some. And let us lift up our bread. Blessed are those that bring forth bread from the work. Berkim hamotzim lekem min haretz. Amen. And with that, we say Shabbat Shalom. And I'm going to, our service is done, but we'll have some more time for conversation and whatnot. Um, before I um, turn off the recorder, I'll just mention um our next service will be in two weeks. We'll have information on that on Facebook and via email. And just a reminder again, if you're not on our email list, email spinozahavra at gmail.com. And finally, um, we are putting our recordings of the services now on YouTube. Um, and so if you ever miss a service or you want to share a service with someone else, um, it's a great way to do that. And I'll put a link in the chat where you can find that. So anyway, I'm going to... Stop the recording and uh